Philip Farah, uh, welcome to uh, Fort Wayne. We at uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace have invited you here, Philip, as you know, as part of our Nakba at 75, uh, the ongoing Palestinian catastrophe series. It's very important to us that we acknowledge and commemorate this sad, tragic, horrific Nakba that uh, uh, the Palestinian people are still undergoing uh, after 75 years. So welcome, and we are looking forward to your insights uh, uh, this uh, time that you're here with us. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Salamu alaikum, and I'm very glad to be here. And thank you for everybody else who is involved in uh, making this production. You'll be, uh, you'll be sharing with us your family story, Philip, and the way we've uh, advertised is your f one family story as a lens right. to the uh, uh, Nakba in 48, but the ongoing uh, Nakba. Yeah. As a Palestinian man, uh, when you hear the word Nakba, what emotions, what memories, what images uh, come to you? A great deal. Um, this morning, for example, you know, I woke up um, to take my shower and uh, do, you know, my morning routine. And uh, part of my morning routine is to listen to Democracy Now!, my uh, favorite source of uh, news. And one of the few news outlets that really uh, tells the story of the Palestinians to some extent. And um, uh, the first item, one of the first items was the commemoration of the one year anniversary of the death of Shirin Abu Akli, the uh, journalist, the Palestinian American journalist who was killed by, Israeli, uh, by an Israeli uh, soldier in Jenin while covering uh, news there for Al Jazeera. Um, and, you know, like you said, it's a continuing Nakba. So uh, every day we are really reminded of uh, uh, what, you know, the Nakba means. Um, uh, of course, you know, there was the trauma of 1948 uh, when uh, over 800,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed, including my family. Um, from, they lived in what became the west part of Jerusalem. Actually, just a few, uh, like less than a kilometer from where I grew up. Uh, but until 67, I could not uh, see, you know, the house uh, that my mother lived on uh, in. A beautiful house. Uh, it was right across the border, and we lived right exactly at the border. Um, so, um, you know, it was very much part of my uh, childhood. And... Um, and then there was 67, another big milestone when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine and parts of Syria and um, Egypt. And, um, uh, you know, and then there were so many other, uh, you know, um, Nakbas uh, in Lebanon for the Palestinian refugees. Uh, Lebanon is where I went to school, uh, American University of Beirut, um, and the continuous... Uh, uh, war on Gaza, you know, uh, really a series of massacres, it's, it's really what it was. So it's, uh, frankly, a daily uh, issue almost for, for me, and for, as, as it is for many thousands of Palestinians. In many ways, um, it has shaped generations of Palestinians, this Nakba, Right. I mean, in terms of um, migration patterns, in terms of just ongoing trauma, in terms of uh, uh, trying to return home, loss of property, all kinds of emotions, all kinds of uh, uh, circumstances that you carry with you from generation to generation. Absolutely. You know, um, recently uh, I was reading a book a novel, actually, but based on real events uh, of um, Talizatar. Um, it was written by a close friend, well, a uh, former neighbor, neighbor from Jerusalem, 
whom I haven't seen for over 60 years. Uh, and um, uh, somehow she reached out through Facebook and um, I became, and she's an accomplished Palestinian novelist. And uh, maybe her best known novel is uh, about the events of Tal Zatar. Um, Tal Zatar is a refugee camp in Beirut. Um, and uh, one of the most horrendous massacres of Palestinians happened there. Um, now, people are much more familiar. It was a massacre conducted by the allies of Israel in Lebanon, who unfortunately claim to be Christians defending, you know, Christianity in their country. Uh, kind of reminiscent of Christian nationalism that we see now Absolutely. in this country. And they were allies of Israel, and they basically wanted to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian uh, refugees from East Beirut, which they controlled, which was under the, their control during the civil war uh, in the 70s, mid-70s. And people are much more familiar with the massacres of Sabra and Shatila, also two, two refugee camps in uh, Beirut. Now, Sabra and Shatila is far better known. The Israelis were involved. They provided cover for the same Lebanese so-called Christians who wanted to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian refugees. The difference is that Tal Zatar, um, it was a massacre that occurred over a period of uh, several months, right? There was a siege. And, um, uh, and, and it was a horrible situation of suffering for many months, culminating with a horrendous massacre. Slaughter. Um, when, the, um, f when the Christian forces, so-called Christian, finally overran the camp and murdered people in cold blood in extremely ugly ways. I mention this because uh, Sabra and Shatila happened over a period of two days, of course, horrendous and not to be discounted at all. But the, the image of something that was continuous and the Americans knew about this. The whole world knew about this. The American embassy in Lebanon is a very large institution. They had their ears on the ground and their eyes on the ground and they knew what was happening and they completely, completely uh, ignored it, if not actually kind of being somewhat complicit by supporting Israel and by supporting the Christian extreme right, you know. And, and that is, a, for me, a kind of um, analogy of the continuous Nakba, yeah. you know. It, <clears throat> it's, it's re except over a period of over 75 years yeah, yeah. rather than a few months. Uh, but I think you get the idea that, you know, uh, the world was looking at, it was like the Warsaw Ghetto uh, and probably lasted longer, the, uh, the heroic fighting for pure survival. They were starving. They did not have um, drinking water. In fact... Um, the only source of drinking water was, were some pipes that the shelling had um, destroyed. Uh, and these pipes were close to where the Christ, so-called Christian forces, I keep saying that, were stationed. And when the people of the camp went to get to fill their you know, uh, containers for drinking water, uh, the, the Christian, the so-called... <laughs> Fa Lebanese fascists used that um, to snipe at them and shoot them and kill them. It was like, you know, a death trap. Yeah. The Americans and, and the French and all the so-called, you know, civilized world was watching this happen. And it's, again, an analogy of what we see today. You know, all the, all the uh, horrible... Um, practices of the Israelis towards the Palestinians, they're very well known. Of they know what's happening in Gaza. They know what's happening in Hebron, the unbelievable apartheid. They know all the killing of children that takes place. 
Uh, but, you know, there's silence. And it is up to us, uh, people like you especially, um, to, to tell the world that, you know, this can, cannot go on. You mentioned uh, that today, uh, May 11th, it's the one-year anniversary of the targeted murder of Shireen Abu Akhli, this right. a Palestinian-American journalist. Um, in addition to the bombings and killings of Palestinians every day, mm -hmm. every day, one, two, three, often more killed, we're finding more and more an assault on Palestinian cultural leaders, leaders in the arts, mm -hmm. uh, uh, theater uh, uh, associations, cultural mm -hmm. organizations, uh, as well as uh, in the media, especially targeting Palestinian journalists right. uh, and even uh, those of the foreign press. Say a word about, I mean, these aren't just insurrection leaders or political leaders. Now, they're, now the Israeli military is going after cultural leaders and the, and the media. Say a word about what's going on. Yeah, so another item in this morning's news, along with the commemoration of uh, Shireen Abu Akhli uh, that I heard on Democracy Now!, is, the, of course, the ongoing bombing of uh, Gaza, you know. And um, there were instances where uh, Israeli bombing um, uh, took out uh, cultural centers, you know, um, where Gaza is really an open air uh, prison. Uh, uh, and this has been the situation for many, many years. And it's like a shooting gallery as well. There's no place to hide. And there's um, hardly any activity for young people to do because um, of the siege on Gaza, the economic uh, siege. Um, it's just a horrible place. But, you know, in that, under that uh, condition, um, you have incredibly creative uh, things happening, you know, uh, on a social level. Dance, uh, music, theater coming out of Gaza. That is really remarkable, you know. People under adversity really uh, find ways, you know, find creative ways to stay alive, uh, not only physically, uh, but also um, spiritually and, and psychologically. Um, so there really is an incredible flowering of uh, culture in Gaza and other places in Palestine. And uh, there have, uh, and you know, the, the, the water of the Mediterranean is horribly polluted because Israel won't allow met essential materials that are needed for reconstruction of um, sanitary facilities, um, wastewater, wastewater um, uh, facilities. So uh, the sewage goes into the Mediterranean and pollutes it horribly. Uh, it used to be one of the most beautiful beaches along the that part of the Mediterranean. And so they swim, you know, when, when, when you're swimming in the uh, Mediterranean, it is a health uh, hazard, right? Um, so the, uh, I mentioned this because there are very few venues for children, uh, for people in general to um, find outlets for um, staying alive really and being psychologically healthy. And there have been attacks on clubs, on uh, you know, theater group uh, headquarters and uh, facilities. And the Israelis know exactly. They know every inch. Uh, you know, Israeli economy is an economy that is largely built on surveillance. You know, uh, they and and um, uh, uh, military industrial technologies that are very advanced. Uh, they know exactly what happens in every inch of Gaza, but they continue. Um, you know, bombing uh, facilities uh, like. Uh, that are involved in the arts and um, the like. Um, it, it really is a, you know, they see Palestinian identity uh, as, as something negative. It, 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 it's viewed as <laughs> part of what they call Palestinian terror. You know, trauma always finds an outlet. Tr trauma always manifests itself somehow. And uh, 
um, it can be, the outlet can be destructive, including violence, or it could, the outlet, you know, the, the trauma can be channeled into the energy uh, uh, in the expression of the imagination. Right. And one of the one of the beautiful things I found about the Palestinian people who I have met mm. over the mm. two decades which I've been involved is the flourishing of the arts, like like you said, uh, among various Palestinian youth centers, particularly. Right. And um, uh, I mean, it's an incredible, incredible channeling positively of this trauma that is a real strong witness to me in my work, in our work here. Right. You're an economist, and uh, I'm glad you brought up about the sanitation and, and the, the, the problems with the water. Uh, part of the ongoing Nakba uh, that needs to be discussed more is Israel's uh, creating of food and water deprivation um, in Gaza, but throughout the West Bank, really, the control of aquifers, controlling the number of calories, that, that, uh, uh, the, the resources that are allowed into Gaza, um, uh, the, the controlling, like I say, of digging wells, mm -hmm. uh, uh, access to aquifers, etc. Talk to us about, uh, about uh, you know, as, as an economist now, looking in uh, at uh, Israel's deprivation of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Say a word about that. You know, um, one of the most horrible... Um, manifestations of occupation and hegemony um, and apartheid. Uh, you see it uh, very much in the occupied territories, uh, territories occupied after 67, but you actually even see it uh, within 48. Uh, when we say within 48, we mean Israel proper. Uh, among uh, Arab communities like Nazareth and um, uh, Umm al-Fahim and uh, other Palestinian uh, uh, towns and villages. Um, the, um, and contrast that with um, similar places in, say, Jordan, right? Um, the, the Arab communities in, in, under the, uh, Israel's hegemonic uh, control uh, are really becoming ghettos, you know? Uh, Israel... You know, in South Africa, you had um, control of populations, and um, and there were different classifications of um, uh, of of the, Af uh, of the African people in uh, in um, uh, South Africa. You know, different kinds of uh, IDs for uh, mixed marriage people, for uh, Indians, for blacks, etc. Um, and, and the different uh, Bantustans, you know, div dividing uh, the local population to control them and to ghettoize them, to really uh, push them into uh, Bantustans. We see that in, 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 in much more concentrated in the small area uh, we call Palestine. Um, ghettoized uh, Arabs uh, isolated from other, you know, one ghetto here, uh, uh, East Jerusalem, another ghetto here in Hebron, and another in the North Nablus, disconnected from another, one another, uh, separated by checkpoints, um, having to use um, really terrible roads because they can't use the highways that Israel controls. Um, all of this is choking, you know, commercial activity and causing uh, pauperization. And, of course, the theft of resources. Like you go to uh, the Jordan Valley, which was, had very prosperous Palestinian agriculture, and, you know, the water has been taken by the settlements, and they uh, grow uh, dates, which um, are very... Uh, and, and other... Um, um, agricultural products that are water intensive that are taken away from the Palestinian population. Right. And so the Palestinian agriculture is, uh, you know, fully, um, um, you know, suffering. 
uh, and um, and that's how you have the popularization. You can't have commerce between ghettos that are isolated from one another. These ghettos are totally dependent on the Israeli economy, and the Israeli economy restricts uh, or has placed all kinds of restrictions, um, physical restrictions, as well as you know uh, types of taxes and customs duties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean. You have uh, shipments uh, of, um, let, let's say, Palestinians are trying to export to their natural markets in Jordan, you know, and a truck of vegetables is trying to get through, and they have to wait at the border for three days. Um, they could cross in 45 minutes from Jerusalem to Amman. Now, sometimes they are held for uh, days, and the vegetables rot. This is just an example. Yeah. And, and the popularization, uh, you see, for example, how a man grew up. Physically, you can see, you know, the growth and the new buildings and, you know, uh, commercial establishments and malls and really modernizing. Contrast that with Jerusalem. Jerusalem still, you know, uh, uh, looks, uh, the, the neighborhoods where the people of Jerusalem would have expanded otherwise uh, and modernized and created new modern infrastructure have taken over, uh, have been taken over by the settlers who are completely surrounding, surrounding Jerusalem, choking it off, you know, and that those were the natural places for Jerusalem to expand and they are no longer there. So Jerusalem is really literally becoming ghettoized, you know, which is such, a, you know, an irony given the experience of Jews in Europe who were ghettoized and, you know, felt that uh, um, they needed a new homeland. Philip, uh, both the United States and Israel are settler colonial projects. You talked about race with South Africa. Uh, so I want, I want you to talk a little bit about the, the racism at, at the heart of some of this. So as a Palestinian American who's lived here much of your adult life, say a word about the racism against the in indigenous people that you've witnessed here and against other people of color. And also the racism inherent in the Zionist project in Israel and Palestine. Yes, I, I believe, you know, I mentioned uh, last night in uh, one of our uh, activities, um, the um, series uh, that my group, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, has uh, been producing about yeah, Christian gonna... Zionism. And the uh, uh, roots of, uh, uh, of um, modern day Zionism are very much steeped in Christian Zionism, which is uh, also, which originates in the doctrine of discovery. It's the same roots uh, that treated uh, colonial people, indigenous people, as inferiors to be conquered and controlled and um, oppressed and uh, marginalized, and their lives really didn't matter. And uh, the, the same continued exactly with uh, uh, even among uh, relatively liberal Israelis, you have this uh, um, narrative of um, in order to save the uh, oppressed uh, Jews of Europe, uh, you, you had to uh, ethnically cleanse the Palestinians because you had no choice. So, you know, the indigenous population's um, rights meant nothing, really. Um, I mean, you have that even among liberal Israelis, uh, unfortunately. Um, there was an interview with um, um, Morris. Benny Morris? Benny Morris, uh, who considers himself a liberal and uh, critical of the excessive... He says it's just such a shame. The, yeah, <laughs> and, and actually he reached a conclusion that Ben-Gurion made a mistake by not going all the way and fully cleansing uh, the, eth the, the Palestinians uh, from, from, I mean, he, he considers himself a liberal, and he said that. Um, 
So, you know, uh, I mean, the same story uh, happens all throughout history. Uh, people who are oppressed in their original countries, you know, um, uh, flee their countries to a new Jerusalem. These are expressions which you know yeah. from this country, from South Absolutely. Africa, from Australia, where, where whites came and took over and uh, 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 ethnically cleansed the indigenous populations. And um, we, we have that uh, in spades in, uh, in uh, Palestine. But you know, it, it goes beyond that also. It's not Israel has got a hierarchy of racism. Uh, the Palestinians are at the bot bottom, but there is racism uh, among Jewish Israelis as well. You know, there are gradations of, uh, of racism in Israel. You have the westernized, uh, the, the um, European Jews who historically uh, were the elite in Israel, who um, really uh, treat uh, Arab Jews Jews who came from Arab countries, uh, just as I'm a Christian Arab, you know, um, there were Arab Jews in Morocco, in Syria, in uh, North Africa, um, other places in North Africa, in Iraq, uh, even in Bukhara and uh, farther afield. And they are really um, um, treated uh, as second class citizenship, uh, citizens. So uh, it's really a very deeply racist society. This is kind of multi-part, so pick, pick wherever you want to jump in. So in the last uh, handful of years, Yeshdin, Beth Selim, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, various US uh, Christian denominations, the UN, universities, and many others have rightly identified uh, Israel as an apartheid regime. Right. Um, this is an this is an important development. So just since I've been involved in this struggle the last two decades, we've seen the framing, the framing go from it's a conflict, well to its occupation. Well now it's an apartheid settler colonial project. So talk to us about the evolution of this framing and why that's important and uh, why those of us who stand with our Palestinian friends can't be shy anymore, can't be tepid anymore when we talk about uh, Israel as an apartheid regime that ethnically, that's ethnically cleansing the Palestinian population. I mean, we need to use that language, don't we? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, my view of this is that um, there really are a lot of parallels between the case of South Africa and the case of Israel uh, as apartheid regimes. Uh, now, they're not identical by any stretch, but there are a lot of commonalities. Um, I think that the, and I think many people agree, uh, students of history um, who are much more steeped in history than I am, that the collapse of apartheid South Africa was more psychological than economical or, or, or military, certainly not military. The, the uh, apartheid regime in uh, South Africa was not threatened in the least uh, in a military fashion by the armed resistance of the um, uh, ANC. Um, and even economically, um, they really weren't very threatened. By the way, we played a, Israel uh, played a very important role in that. While there were beginning to be sanctions by Western powers against South Africa, uh, Israel uh, stepped in and was indirectly channeling Western uh, technology to South Africa. They said, okay, Bell helicopter, you can't sell directly to, um, to uh, South Africa. Sell to us and we will resell it back to uh, South Africa. Anyway, um, 
uh, South African apartheid Sy sy failed psychologically, so even economically, they weren't really hurting that much with the help of allies like Taiwan and Israel, which were very close allies of, uh, of the South African uh, regime. Uh, but psychologically, they did collapse when the movement against apartheid in the West started becoming stronger. And here's the psychology. The psychology is we, the white South Africans, are really part of the civilized world, which means only uh, white uh, Europe and white America and Australia, maybe, you know. Uh, and um, even though they make some noises, you know, uh, that they are uncomfortable with our treatment of the native population. They really, really see that we are under siege and we have to treat the natives, keep them in place, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That was the mindset. But when the uh, movement against apartheid in South Africa started by students, started by marginalized communities like African Americans, uh, started maybe by some progressive unions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, started picking up, especially among the churches, frankly. Uh, you're getting closer to the mainstream, and slowly that means you go, you're getting to Congress. And, you know, when that happened, when, when the, the progressive forces in the West told um, the South African white regime that th you are not part of us, we reject your... Uh, morality. We reject your ethics. We reject your horrible practices against the indigenous population. That's when the South African regime collapsed. Now, coming to Israel, that's the same thing, really. You know, the the uh, the Israeli uh, elite, which is mostly of Western European origin, you know, see themselves. That's the racism. The racism is they yeah. see themselves. They live in a sea of, uh, uh, of, in the Middle East that is Arab, you know, and um, mostly Arab, and they see themselves as superior, you know, and pass part of, <laughs> maybe I'm exaggerating, a master race kind of mentality, and they have um, uh, privileges that uh, are God given. And if uh, we here in the U.S., especially in the U.S., um, tell them, no, you know, that's not acceptable, I think that will be a huge uh, thing, and it's happening, like you said. It's one thing to protest on governmental levels, and that may or probably won't happen, but when you lose the people, mm. you know, when you lose the people. There's so much more I want to ask you, you know, we could talk about, but I... I want to close with a two-part question for you. The Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. Mm -hmm. So I want you to say a little bit more. So here's the two parts. Part one, say a little word about who you are and, and why Christian Zionism is still a dangerous, heretical theology and uh, political danger, right. not only in evangelical churches, but also in the mainline church. Absolutely. So that's part one. And part two, you and uh, your fellows, men and women in the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, have been consultants with various denominations mm -hmm. in the U.S., Talk to us a little bit about some of the work of the churches that you and your fellow members in uh, PCAP are involved with pushing back, uh, resisting, and helping to change the narrative uh, in Israel. Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, you know, um, Zionism um, in its modern manifestation, starting with uh, Theodor Herzl in Austria, uh, really did not bring a lot of new ideas. Uh, it basically uh, borrowed the ideas that preceded it uh, by at least decades uh, of Christian Zionists. Uh, 
um, they didn't call themselves Christian Zionists. They called themselves, um, uh, I remind me of the theological categories, uh, um, Dispensational. Yeah, dispensationalists. Yeah, pre millennial, post millennial dispensation. Exactly, you're right. And uh, that's what they call themselves. They do not call themselves Christian Zionists. Uh, but uh, they really essentially um, formed all the basics that Herzl uh, took and, you know, developed and uh, created into a movement, uh, the Zionist movement, uh, which catered. Um, which uh, was continuously seeking imperial, um, tut how do you call it, uh, support. They, uh, the Herzl and the Zionist leaders were basically shopping for colonial powers to back them up. And um, they went to the French and they convinced the French, they tried to convince the French that, hey, if you adopt our uh, goals, uh, you will uh, have advantage vis-a-vis -vis the British colonialists or the Suez Canal and all of that, um, the road to India, and that didn't work. Um, they were playing, they went to the Kaiser Wilhelm uh, uh, with, you know, shopping for the same kind of uh, sponsorship, didn't work. The, it worked with the British, um, the most powerful colonial power. And it worked with uh, people like George Lloyd, who really was more responsible for the Balfour Declaration than Balfour himself, yeah. and who was an avid, uh, avowed um, Christian Zionist. Um, he, uh, um, but also, <laughs> more importantly, a, the leader of a colonial power that uh, subjugated uh, people all over the globe. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, roots of uh, modern-day Israeli ideology goes back to Christian Zionists. Now, you know, in the U.S. especially, uh, young uh, American Jews are not buying it anymore. They see that, um, that the supporters of Israel, the most uh, extreme supporters of Israel in, the, in America are, all, are at the same time people who are who tend to be on the racist uh, spectrum of the political uh, uh, political spectrum. They see that they are against um, homosexuals, against LBGTQ. They see that they are against um, uh, economic uh, uh, reform. Uh, they see that intersectionality and they're not buying it anymore, you know. And who is Israel now counting on? Uh, a very, very powerful ally in the U.S., the Christian Zionists, like uh, Heiji and many others, um, uh, who um, are really powerful uh, in, 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 in U.S. politics. And they are the allies that uh, Israel counts on, despite uh, the fact that they are really anti-Semitic. They believe that, uh, you know, the second coming is predicated on um, on Israel winning, um, you know the story, and um, and then uh, Jews who don't convert, tough are luck going for them to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, despite that racism, which many, uh, uh, I, I mean, certainly uh, it's becoming more and more transparent. Um, uh, so you know. Israel is losing a great deal of support among young uh, American Jews, and that's very threatening, and uh, relying more and more on Christian Zionists. So, so we see our role you know, in exposing this. Um, so tell us about some of the work that you right. and Alex Awa, John Kutab, and some yes. of the other uh, 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 right. members of PCAP are doing with churches in the U.S. Right. So... Uh, uh, Palestinian Americans are a really small uh, minority. We are uh, really, you know, a very small community in the U.S. Um, but we have discovered that we have very strong allies uh, in the churches. Um, and we have strong allies in the churches, you know, primarily because the churches are more independent of uh, the centers of power 
than uh, even the trade unions, you know. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, money talks everywhere, but, um, and, uh, you know, those who have money have a lot of power on the hill. <laughs> um, but uh, the churches are at least to some extent independent of that uh, in the moneyed influence. And so um, we, we see the churches as a place that has uh, historically uh, supported uh, pro at least large segments of uh, the church, church community, uh, has played an essential role throughout American history in progressive causes, in fighting slavery, in civil rights movement, in the movement against uh, nuclear armaments, in ending the war in Vietnam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we think that uh, uh, the we have found that we have a lot of allies in the churches. I mean, the churches, of course, uh, have a strong connection to the Holy Land, the holy places, and they have pre you know the Anglicans, the Episcopalians. And the Lutherans have clinics in Palestine, have schools, have uh, churches, etc. And they see. And what you see, you cannot unsee. And um, so there, we have a lot of allies in the churches. And we think, being a small community, that we can leverage um, our connection with our allies in the churches. And uh, so we are a, present ourselves to our allies in the churches as a resource. Um, as Palestinian Christians who have lived the Nakba and who can tell our story uh, in, in convincing ways. And um, it's been, it's had an impact. Um, we are not the sole reason uh, that uh, the Episcopal Church, for example, has uh, passed resolutions condemning um, um, the Israeli occupation and uh, calling for divestment uh, from uh, companies that profit from the occupation. Uh, but we have helped uh, our allies in the churches lobby their denominations to pass resolutions like that, to withdraw investments from their pension funds, uh, from companies like Caterpillar and uh, Hewlett Packard. Um, so, and that's powerful. Uh, again, it's not going to make a huge difference economically for Israel that uh, the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ, uh, um, the um, you know, various other denominations have uh, pulled their investments from, um, uh, from companies like Caterpillar or Hewlett Packard, but there's a very big uh, psychological impact uh, that, hey, you know, we don't uh, approve of uh, the way you are treating the Palestinians. So if, <clears throat> if I was a member of one of the mainline denominations, I should be looking to, uh, um, uh, to find that Palestine-Israel network or that Palestinian solidarity organization within the framework of our church to align myself and to maybe work with. Absolutely, I yeah. think that is invaluable. And uh, we have built very, very strong, like for example, I'm on the advisory um, committee of the Episcopal uh, Palestine Israel Network. Um, I work very closely with the United Church of Christ uh, Palestine Israel Network. Um, Alex Howard, the Reverend Alex Howard, uh, and Jonathan, like you mentioned, Jonathan Kutab and others, have very strong connections with some of these pins, we call them, the Palestine yeah. Israel Networks. Yeah, so I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Presbyterians and IPMN, United Church of Christ, the Disciples, the Methodists, UMKR, Kairos Response, right. the Lutherans, I mean, uh, a Quaker pin, Menno right. pin. Exactly. And I know I'm leaving out a few, but uh, um, I mean, very, very Episcopal a Peace Fellowship, their pin group. So the mainline denominations uh, are on the side of the angels here, and they've been working very closely with Palestinian partners in Palestine itself. That's and right. you all have been a real important bridge in uh, PCAP right. in helping make that happen. Right. Philip Farah, thank you very much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.